increasing your ability or adding an ability in your life invites an equivalent flow in your life. If you add an ability in your life, it adds an equivalent flow to fill the new capacity that you have. So if your capacity is a cup, then the measure coming back your way is a cup. But if you change cup to bucket, what you are going to be receiving is going to be bucket size. If you change from bucket to a drum, what you're going to be re receiving is, so God measures out to you according to the measure that you have or according to the capacity that you have. But in a house like this, there's always a prophetic word that comes and that word is yours. That word sometimes comes as a teaching. Sometimes that word of God will come as a pastoral word to care. Sometimes you hear an evangelistic word that causes you to make a decision. But you will once in a while hear a prophetic word. When you hear that word, hearken unto it. Honor that word. Stand in awe to that word. And embrace it and take it. Make it a part of your life. That when the devil comes your way, you'll be able to say, the word of God has been spoken about my life. I cannot fail in life. I'm going to succeed. I cannot lack. God is on my side. More than enough is coming my way. The prophetic word in our house is abundance. Today I want to talk about increasing your abilities so that you can experience abundance. Increasing your abilities for abundance. That you can experience the abundance that God has for you. Matthew 25, verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven, this is a parable Jesus said, gave, and a parable is a story that actually um, explains and teaches the truth of heaven in a way that we can understand. It's a story that uses examples we can understand to teach us a complicated truth of the kingdom. He says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. And he says, to each according to his own ability. So the talents God gives, the things that God supplies to us, whether they are gifts, whether they are talents that we can use, whether they are resources, the experience that we have on earth, he says that we can compare the kingdom of God and how God supplies to our needs and how he supplies even the spiritual issues of our lives. He gives those things according to our abilities. So if my ability level is low, I'm a one talent person, he will give me a one, ta one talent. If I'm a two talent, so it is according to my ability and so he looks at my ability or my capacity to hold that which is giving, and so he will not have waste. If I'm a one liter vessel, he will not put two liters in me. He will have to put one liter until I increase my ability, and then he can put two talents, or he can put five talents. He will not put beyond my ability. Amen? So the ability is what actually determines how much of anything that you receive from God, how much of it that you will have. God is not a waster. He checks our abilities. It doesn't matter how much you, you, you ask him, how much you pray, how much you seek. Until you increase your ability or your capacity, he's not going to pour beyond what you can hold so that he doesn't break you. He's a father, good, good father. He will not break you in the process of bringing something to you. Amen. So abilities are tied to our experience. We have to have abilities if we are going to experience everything God has. And so even as I pray, even as I say, God, give me this. I need to check whether I have the ability to hold what I'm asking God for. If I say, God, give me a job as a surgeon, I have to ask myself, do I have the abilities to take care of somebody who has come for surgery? Am I, do I have the abilities for that? He will not give you something that is beyond your ability to handle. Amen. God wants and is able to do abundantly more than we see and uh, more than we seek for, but the limitation is our ability to handle or manage and uh, that is what we call capacity. Ephesians 3 verse 20. The Bible says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. 
He's able to do exceedingly abundantly. This is not even abundance. It's more than abundance. God is able to answer your prayer. God is able to do what you imagine. God is able to do way more than that. But it's according to our ability to handle. He will not break you to bless you. He wants to bless you without breaking you. Amen. He wants you to enjoy the abundance. But it's the capacity that is our limitation. And this has been the limitation of the church. Especially the Pentecostal church. Which um, one of the children of the Pentecostal church. I can tell you that. One of the deficiencies we have in the church is the increase of capacity. And for years, the Pentecostal church has had just one answer to all the problems of life. Pray. Just one answer. Pray. If you cannot, if you don't get an answer, fast and pray. And when God speaks, you come back and pray more. But God is saying beyond prayer, there is something beyond prayer. When you pray, I will answer, but this is the part I want you to do. And this is what I need for you to do so that you can be able to enjoy the things that he has for us. Amen. Amen. The children of Israel would have gone from Egypt to the promised land in 11 days only. The journey was supposed to take a very short time. 11 days journey, walking less than two weeks. It was that short. It wasn't very far. But they could not handle the route that took 11 days. I'll read for you some uh, scripture in Exodus 13 verse 17. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. It was the shortest route to the promised land. God said, can you imagine the, how quickly it was for people to just move from Egypt it was 11 days, but God did not allow them to go through that road. And God said, if the people are faced with battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. This is God saying in heaven. If these people go by that route, that is going to be chaos. Because the day they face war and they see a few people die and they see people with wounds from arrows and swords, these people are going to return to Egypt. Verse 18, so God led them in the roundabout way through the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Thus the Israelites left Egypt like an army ready for battle. So they left Egypt. They had no experience of war. They were slaves all these 400 years. They, none of them knew how to fight a battle. All the battles were fought by Egypt. And so God had to train them and use little armies in the wilderness and use all these things so that they will be able to come into the promised land and wage war when God has revealed himself to them as Jehovah, as the one who is going to fight their battles and supply and keep them safe as, as their shield. He had to take them through that route so that they will be able to fight battles in a spiritual way. And so God took them through that. They had no ability. To go through the shortest route, it took them longer to do what they were supposed to do in a short time. Amen. So the issue of ability is important. And I don't want you to ignore it. I want you to know that that is the key and the bridge that takes you from where you stand to be able to experience the blessings that are yours. Because I don't want to go to heaven and find all these blessings were mine. But my capacity, I was a one liter capacity vessel. I was not able to hold all these millions of liters that God wanted me to hold because I was just like a cup. And many of us are not more than a cup when it comes to the things that God wants for our lives. We all can expand. We all can get better. But it's very, very elusive because sometimes we tell ourselves we are there. We are more than where we, we were expecting. We have done and achieved beyond what we are expecting. But God wants us to experience more. A horse is fast, but it cannot fly. Why? It cannot fly because it has no wings. You may prophesy to it. You may lay hands on it. You may make every decree that you want. But until a horse has the, uh, the, the wings, the added ability, it uh, will never fly. You can memorize, you can even speak scripture to it. You can even pronounce the word of God. You can lay your hands and your feet on a horse. It will not fly until you have been able to put wings on it. And that is, we can now conclude there that it's your, your experience in life is not limited by God's ability. 
It's not God's ability. It's limited by your ability or capacity to hold that which God wants to pour in your life. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Even here in Kansas City, God wants to do more than you're experiencing in your own home. He's able to do it. The limitation is not his ability. The limitation is not his willingness. The limitation generally is our capacity to be able to hold that which God has for us. Amen? And so that's a principle for life. And I pray that that will be clear in your mind. It will be clear in, you, in your heart. It's easy to close our eyes and worship and pray. And that's good. And that's part of it. But there is a responsibility each one has. And each one of us, you are, the move is yours. The next one is yours. God has done his part. And so it is you and I to do our part so that we can experience the abundance that we want to see in our lives. And that can be a part of our lives from here going forward. That we are always going to be able to receive everything. When we say, God, give me this thing. I want to ask myself, what abilities do I want to increase in my life so that I can experience that which God has for me? There's something else I want us to know today. I want us to know something else that increasing your ability or adding an ability in your life invites an equivalent flow in your life. If you add an ability in your life, it adds an equivalent flow to fill the new capacity that you have. Every time you increase something in your life, that is an ability, the capacity, the ability to hold that which God has for you. Every time you increase that, automatically God sends resource so that it fuels that so that you will not have gaps in your life. Amen? So for every new ability or Capacity you create, there is an equivalent flow of new supply from God. Matthew 9, verse 27. I want to read a few verses and see whether I'll go through this quickly. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I can be able to do this? So he's looking at them. They are shouting following him. And so when he comes to the house, he says, do you believe I can do this? Do you have the ability to believe to the extent that I can do this? And say, they, they say to him, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. So God is, Jesus here is saying, what you have is according to your faith. What you are believing for. What capacity you have. What you will get is according to that. And so he releases enough and he says, if you have the ability to receive healing, then you will have healing. And if that ability is not there, then there will not be a flow of that. Luke 6, 38. Think about this verse, but don't think about it in terms of giving. But li listen to it. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. And he says, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So if your capacity is a cup, then the measure coming back your way is a cup. But if you change cup to bucket, what you are going to be receiving is going to be bucket size. If you change from bucket to a drum, what you're going to be receiving is, so God measures out to you according to the measure that you have or according to the capacity that you have. It's your capacity that determines what you're going to be receiving. And so it is important. And we spiritual people, we don't want to hear stuff like this. We want something that actually puts all the responsibility in heaven and none on us. All the responsibility on God and none on us. And so we can come back and say, God, I'm waiting. God, I'm waiting. I'm suffering here, but I'll wait. I'll suffer for you. But God is saying, none of us needs to suffer. Increase your capacity. I have a flow. I have no use of all these blessings. They are yours. Add capacity and you'll see an equivalent flow coming in your life. Amen. The measure you use, he says here, for the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So what I have as a supply is according to the measure that I have or I use. Psalms 81 verse 10. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he says, open your mouth wide and I will feel it. That means when the mouth is open, 
If I see capacity emptiness, I'm going to fill it with staff. And I'm going to fill it with the Holy Spirit, if that's what you're looking for. I'm going to fill it with power. I'm going to fill it with gifts. I'm going to fill it with resources. I'm going to fill whatever is empty and hungry. I'm going to fill it to capacity. So open it. Increase your capacity. Open for me new abilities and new doors and see what I'm going to do in your life. That is what he's saying here. Open up new ability and I will fill it with a supply of blessing. Let me read for you this story of a woman in 2 Kings chapter 4. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me. And do you have, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maid servant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, do not gather just a few. So what he's saying is, go create capacity. Don't create little, create a lot. And he says, go, actually go borrow. I know you don't have, but to create capacity, you can even go and borrow from your friends. Empty vessels. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. I can almost suspect that whatever this woman was, she was not some of the tribes that I know. Because some people would have gone and said, okay, first of all, can I build another house? Because I need a house that can fit all the jars but this lady she went to the neighbors a few of them collected a few jars closed the door and told the sons let's try this so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her sons bring me another vessel she's getting excited and the momentum is coming she's seeing more space more oil more space more oil bring another jar more oil and she's getting excited and she says bring me another jar and the sons come and say we don't have another one they are all done and he said to her there is not another vessel so the oil ceased so when there was no other empty vessel, no more capacity to hold anymore, the supply ceased. Supply ceases when you have no more space, when you have no abilities, when you have no new place to hold that which God has for you. And so, and then she came to and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt and you and your sons live on the rest. And the assumption here is that you have a lot. I hope she did not borrow four or five jars. When we meet in heaven, if she'll be there, I'll ask her. And ask her, how, about how many jars did you have? Why didn't you borrow more? Why didn't you get some more? And as long as there's capacity to hold more oil, God will continue to allow a flow. When the, there is no capacity. So this is the principle for me. The miracle working power only flows when there is emptiness, when there is need, when there is capacity, and not just emptiness, when there is a created ability to actually hold that which God is sending your way. Amen. Your capacity is a measure to, uh, you can handle before breaking or overflowing to wastage. It's what you can actually be able to handle. Amen. I remember I... I grew up in a village. I didn't grow up in a big town. But in our village, uh, there was, uh, in the shopping center in the town, in the small town, there was actually electricity. And I remember one time, people were coming from a wedding, uh, for a wedding from another village, another place, another province. And when they landed in our small place, they were asking whether this is Nairobi. They were looking at it, whether this is Nairobi. Yet, we used to actually, on very rare occasions, wear shoes and go to Nairobi, the city. But to some people, they had never seen something as big as our city. So they thought that when you go to that other place and you see all these things. And so every one of us has a measure that we, we can handle. And there's a measure that looks overwhelming and too big for us. And the moment you start increasing and changing and moving forward, that is when God's blessings start flowing in your life. 
One man was seen fishing and he had a stick. He had his uh, fishing rod and a stick that he was carrying. And every time he caught a fish, he would measure it and then throw it back if it was longer than the stick. And if it was shorter, he would keep it. And someone asked this guy, what's the philosophy? What's the deep thing that you are hiding behind this stick? And the guy said, I have a pan at home. And I measured the pan with this stick. And anything bigger than this stick cannot fit in my pan, so I throw it away. <laughs> and we, we can laugh at that man, but many of us actually have that kind of mentality. Many of us, anything bigger than what our mind, our mindset is, we cannot handle. And I'm going to be, it's going to be a little rough here, but please hold. I'm going to turn back and talk other things, but it's going to be a little rough here. Uh, Acts chapter 10 verse 9, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, I want to show you Peter, a man that was a man of God, a man that had seen miracles, but he still had a problem with capacity in his mind. And this is on a spiritual level. Peter went up on the roof. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. A trance is, this is where you are not asleep. You are not very deep in sleep. But again, you are not awake. You are there in the middle. You are falling in and out of sleep. He's in a trance. And he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then the voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Have you ever heard holier than thou? This man is preaching to God himself. God is saying, wake up and eat. And he's saying, God, you know, <laughs> we don't eat this stuff. I don't know where, what you're thinking. You don't eat this stuff. He's holier than God himself. The voice, verse 15, the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Amen. Now you see, what this actually means is that Sometimes, and because this was about the Gentiles, he knew that only Jews were accepted before God. He knew that only Jews were supposed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not the Gentiles. Then God comes and says, I've called the Gentiles clean. The door for the Gentiles is now open. And Christ had even told him earlier, he had said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Not the key, it is the keys of the kingdom. You'll open the kingdom for the Jews on the day of Pentecost, and then you'll open the kingdom for the Gentiles, and that is in Cornelius' house. So he was told, uh, these people, I have now opened the door for the Gentiles, because I call them clean, you should not call them unclean. God is stretching his capacity. His capacity before was Jews only for the kingdom. Gentiles cannot be saved. But God is stretching his mind. He's saying the same Holy Spirit can dwell in a Jew, can also dwell in a Gentile. You came from the same soil. To God, you are all the same. We are all children of God. You are chosen not by merit. It's just by choice. And so God can also choose somebody else. So Peter had to be expanded in that way and his mind to be stretched. But Peter was not going to take it just like that. He was saying, hey, um, I know we can get saved, but I don't know about these Gentiles. They eat all kinds of things. They eat blood. They eat, you know, a rabbit. These guys can eat even pork. They, they, these people cannot be saved. And that's why God brings that whole um, diet and says, what I've called clean, you will not call unclean. So you need to increase your capacity and allow your minds to embrace others. Amen? People, this is people beyond your tribe. People beyond your race. People beyond your nation. God saves everybody. And all of us are filled in the Holy Spirit. We may not speak your language, but we are full of him. 
Loved by God. My name in the book of life. Next to probably yours. But it's in the book of life. And so you have to expand. If we are going to see God do great things. And abundance in this house. As a church. We have to enlarge our hearts. We have to enlarge our hearts. And embrace each other. And not be divided by those who carry the tribalistic spirit among us. It is the truth. That God loves us all. God is looking for a multicultural church. God wants us to embrace each other. If we are going to see an abundance and an increase beyond what we have here as a church, we have to have hearts that see the way God sees. Hearts that are enlarged. We have to have capacity to see somebody from another race, another tribe, another person, see them as one of us, embrace them and love them so that we can see God do great and wonderful things in this life. Amen. Let me move on. Solomon, when he became king, he needed to expand his leadership. He had, in those days, kings were one-dimensional. They were politicians and nothing else. If they went beyond that, like David, they became good army men, good soldiers, commander-in-chief, nothing else. But when Solomon came to power, he refused that old mindset and he said, I want more from this. And 1 Kings 4.29, God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the east and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else. Now, here are the names of the wise men of the east, including Ethan, the Ezraite, and the sons of Mahal, Heman, Kalkol, and Dada. I mean, if you want to have good names for your kids, call your kid Kalkal. <laughs> Dada. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. Listen to verse 32. This is all the things that Solomon was. He composed some 3,000 proverbs. So this guy is an author and a poet. To do proverbs like that, because those proverbs, some of those, I study proverbs. I live out my life is in Proverbs and Psalms. I love those, and that is where I gravitate to every time I open the Bible. But the Proverbs, the Proverbs of Solomon have the wisdom, contain the wisdom. Of, this guy had this gift. He was the greatest poet, and he still remains the greatest poet of our time. He wrote 105 songs. That means he was a songwriter. He had to have the skill of writing songs. He wrote 1,000 1, songs. He could speak with authority. That means he, will, he could speak with knowledge about all kinds of plants. From the great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from the cracks in the wall. That means he knew everything there is to know about plants. He was a botanist. He could tell anything about even the ones that grow in the cracks of the wall. He could speak with authority about them and say how they grow, what diseases they encounter, how you can improve them, how you can maybe even do great things with them. He knew how to do that. He could speak with authority about animals, all animals. No wonder, and, he's, and he, uh, even small creatures, no wonder you could say, go visit the ant. He would talk about bees. He would talk about lizards. He talks about eagles. He talks about all these animals that fly in the air. He talked with authority having studied. Maybe he came out with his books and he would study the eagle from far and watch it from a distance and he would write notes and he would study them and he's written powerfully and spoke with authority about all these animals. And then when you come to fish, he spoke about this um, this marine life, he would talk about anything that you know in the ocean. He was that wise. And the Bible says in 34, and kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. That means they would come to be given advice. He was an advisor to kings, many of them. And they would bring gold to pay him as they came for advice. He received gold in the equivalent of more than a billion dollar worth of gold every year. As he gave advice just from his consulting business to all the politicians of the world. That means he knew territories. He knew histories of nations. This man was not just a king. But he said, God, 
You've called me to lead this nation. Give me wisdom so that I'll have capacity to understand. And because I have that capacity, then the blessings will flow my way. And this is how he grew. Exodus 28 verse 2. uh, The Bible here says, make sacred garments for your brother Elon and give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they they, they are to make garments for Elon for his consecration so he may serve as priest. So God gave some people skilled workers. Verse 3. Skilled workers. Wisdom brings skill. The wisdom of Solomon brought the skill of songwriting, poems, and poetry, and writing. It brought the skill. It brought all these skills so that he was able to counsel and advise kings and uh, advise uh, leaders of territories. So the wisdom of God will bring skill. And he's talking here about skill in uh, Exodus 28. That even the makers of garments only hire the skilled workers that can actually do the work to make Aaron the garments so that he will be able to serve as priest. Exodus 31 verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bazarel, son of Uri, son of Hul, the, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. And he says, What those skills? To make artistic designs for gold, silver, and bronze, and to cut and set stone to work in wood, So God gives wisdom, but in that wisdom, there is the skill, a skill. Wisdom is not just something I have here so I can feel puffed up. Wisdom is, it comes also with skills to be able to solve the practical problems uh, of life and be able to solve them in a godly manner. How do you increase capacity? I have a few minutes. How do you increase capacity? Uh, Number one, ask God to increase your capacity. Ask God to increase your abilities or your capacity. Ask God to increase your capacity. 1 Kings 3, 7. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. Amen? Who is able to judge this? So Solomon here is praying and saying, give me an understanding heart. And God later comes back and says, because you did not seek for money and you did not seek for gold, I'll give you gold, but I'll also give you a wise and an understanding heart. So that you'll be able, and none was wiser than Solomon. To this day, no one is known to have been wiser than Solomon. So when you ask God, God helps you to enlarge your heart. God gives you the ability to acquire knowledge. God gives you the wisdom. It gives you the understanding. He gives your mind the capacity to understand more so that you're going to be understanding. So you begin there, but this is not the end. You ask God, but you do the study. When Solomon prayed, he still had to go back and study animals and study these things and give his heart and his mind so that he can understand those words. And then from there, he meditated and he carefully came out with proverbs and advice and counsel so that it was given to the people. First Chronicles 4.10, this is Jabez. Jabez cried out to to the God of Israel, Oh, that you may bless me. And he says, enlarge my territory. That is, increase me on the inside. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I'll be free from pain. And God granted his request. That means God enlarged him so that he was more blessed and more noble than any of his brothers. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel. And you can also pray and and ask God, enlarge me in this city. Enlarge my life. I'm one track. I do one thing. This is not enough for my life. I'll never see abundance here. Enlarge me. Expand me. Take me beyond the limitations that surround my life today. So that I'll see more and I'll be a blessing and not cause pain to those that are around me. Prayer can enlarge you. Prayer is the beginning. You cannot have any abundance in your life without beginning in prayer. If you don't begin in prayer, it will be human effort. It will not last you a long time. 
And what, but when you believe, you start with prayer, God will do great and wonderful things in your life. Number two, believe and act on the prophetic words that you hear in God's house. Second Chronicles 20, 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Okay? So how do you expand? How do you prosper? He says, hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe what God says in his word. But he says also, believe what his prophets say, and you shall pro prosper. And in our day, we don't have prophets that move around like in the olden days and prophesying for the nation and prophesying over people's life. God has released people among us, and he has given them a prophetic grace. And those act as prophets in the house of God. But the goal that God has is to make us, each one of us, that we may have a prophetic grace that we may speak in our own lives. But in a house like this, there's always a prophetic word that comes and that word is yours. That word sometimes comes as a teaching. Sometimes that word of God will come as a pastoral word to care. That sometimes you hear an evangelistic word that causes you to make a decision, but you will once in a while hear a prophetic word when you hear that word, hearken unto it, honor that word, stand in awe to that word and embrace it and take it, make it a part of your life. And when you do, you shall prosper. Amen. I've told some of you my experience, some of you do not know, but when I was preaching back in the village, I think it was in 98, um, we, I worked with a church, Gospel Calvary Church that was in the city. And they had visitors who had come, and one weekend they had uh, visiting speakers. So uh, the pastor there, a good friend of ours, he sent uh, people to our, to our house in the morning to just come and worship with us. And, um, and they are ministers. So we talked a little bit, and uh, they were speaking in, our, in, in the church uh, on that Sunday morning. And when they spoke, even five minutes, before five minutes in the preaching, this man that I had just met a few hours before turned around and he said, God told me that you're going to America. That time we were not even talking about America. Those who know me well know that I did not want to come to this country. I had friends who had come and they had come back, backslid and almost. Some of them never recovered. And so I, I feared this country because of what it had done to people that I know and I did not want to come. Again, I was doing well. It, there's no challenging. I had assimilated very well and I was doing ministry among people that actually I loved very much. But he said, you will go to America. And some people believe that word with all their hearts. One lady after the service came, um, uh, Mama Kabiro, she came and she said to me after the service, you bring me a watch. When you go to America, I just need a watch. That's it. That's it. A watch. And that time I just, you know, in my heart I'm saying I'm not going anywhere. I don't even want, I have no plan, America where? So after some time, we moved from that city. We went and planted another church in another city, not very far. And I passed at these two churches uh, together. And I went, I left the elders that I had in this one church. And they still continue to this day. Talk to them almost every day. And um, the church here. And then where we went to plant the church. I remember one day. I've heard the voice of God. It was mid, I think mid-June. There was a public holiday. My wife was home. So I came home and I said, I heard the voice of God. I know that God wants me to go to America. I don't know where. And she said, I've, I told you. I told you. Because she had told me before. She wanted to apply for a green card one time. And I said, well, uh, let's forget it. Let's do ministry here until God speaks. So we agreed. We prayed. And this is the prayer. Remember, she, she now is settled. She has her own place. I told her, if we are going, you have to tell me that I'll, if I go, you will follow me there. And she said, she laughed and she said, do you first of all go? And I said, you will have to tell me before. We, and I, I, I don't know whether she, I made her swear, but we held hands and we prayed before I went to look for a visa to come. But I want you to know this. When I agreed with the prophetic word that had been spoken in the church, 
And I said, that word really was from God. When I agreed, I felt like God was chasing me away from Kenya. I did not. I, I remember going to the embassy. They never checked any of my papers. And then someone, they said, okay, well, we have to do a fundraiser for the ticket to come. And I told them, don't. If it's God, he'll open the door. And some lady called my wife and she said, has pastor found the money to go to America? Here he's going. And this is not someone who goes to our church. And my wife said, let me call him and find out. He called me. I was having tea with one of my cousins. And I said, tell her I'm waiting upon God. And I know God will come through. She said, don't wait anymore. Go home. Tomorrow let's meet at the bank. She came to the bank. Where we were standing with my wife, she didn't speak to us. She went into the manager's office, came back with a brown paper bag and gave us the money and she left. And she left. Counted it was enough, more, more than enough money for my travel to come here. And I looked at my wife and I said, God is chasing me away from here. It's the prophetic word. When you agree with the prophetic word, things line up for you. This is what the Bible says. That hear the prophets, believe his prophets and you will prosper. How many people that have seen, you have seen it by example from this platform, a prophetic word changing people's lives. It has raised our standards. It has transformed us as a church. You know, we don't have gimmicks. We don't have any, any pretensions. We don't, we, you, if you've been here, you know, we don't, you know, put people down. If you fall by the spirit, it's the spirit of God. And you can fall back there or here. We have nothing against that. But we, I hate gimmicks in God's house. If it's God's power, it will work in somebody's life. And you have seen how the prophetic word, how the prophetic word has worked in people's lives. There are people who still believe that I connect people. I'm the greatest connector in the city. That's why people get married. Because I connect them. And some of you have had to look at people in the face. And tell them that that's not what it is. Amen. It is when you believe the prophetic word, people wonder what is happening to you. If you receive the word of abundance and receive it in your life, I want you to know people will wonder where you got the money. People will start even giving you names and even calling you all kinds of things because they, it's hard for people to see how the prophetic word works. And I want you to know it is clear. He says, believe in the Lord your God. You will be as, believe his prophets and you will prosper. Believe his prophets, you will prosper. Expansion comes from receiving a prophetic word and acting on it and standing on it and spraying on it and fighting the spiritual battles on it. That when the devil comes your way, you'll be able to say the word of God has been spoken about my life. I cannot fail in life. I'm going to succeed. I cannot lack. God is on my side. More than enough is coming my way. The prophetic word in our house is abundance. Abundance. And that is what God is saying in this house. Amen. That is how you fight. You take the prophetic word and fight using that word. Amen. It's when you take that word and say, I will not be hindered. I will not be stopped by things that surround my life. I know what God says about my life. Even if I don't have the prophetic word, I know what God says. I'll believe in the word of the Lord. But when the prophets have spoken, I will prosper because I'll stand on the word that they have spoken. Amen. Number three, these things are important. Number three, positive associations will increase your capacity. Positive associations. There is nothing as damaging as negative associations. And this is not for teenagers. This is for grown-ups. Evil company corrupts good manners. If you hear that, we always think about youth, teenagers. But it has messed a lot of grown-ups' lives. Just that planting of a seed. I try to avoid people that will plant the wrong seed in my life. And I want you to know people try. Oh, you, oh so and so is a leader in your church? Yeah, yeah. You know why? Yeah. And, the, and, I, and I tell people off. Quick. Remember one time someone came to see us with my wife. They don't go here. They came to see us about some. And I looked at them and said, I don't doubt what you're saying. And it may be true, it may be false, but I cannot discuss a church member with you. 
And they said, no, no, pastor, don't take it. No, I said, no, 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 let's change the subject. I will not discuss a church member with you. And I'm not saying you are lying. What I want you to know, I cannot do that. Because you allow that stuff to come into you, you start looking at somebody suspicious. Even when you are praying, you are saying, let me, eh? they said, <laughs> evil associations are going to destroy and I've seen the devil use and the devil will use secret phone calls, people in your home, people when you are in their homes to plant seeds in your life that are going to probably lead you in a path away from your destiny and away from what God has for you. Number four, limiting vows and statements that you have made that will limit your life. You have to cancel those. You have to cancel limit, limiting personal vows that will limit your life. I can never be married by an Kikuyu. I can never be married by somebody that is not from my tribe. So those statements are very limiting because what you are saying is, God, you are not expansive. My ability and capacity can only marry, can only go with somebody that is from my own tribe. Silence. And then we move on. <laughs> I can never do nothing. Some people have made that statement. Let me tell you something that I've discovered. The last few groups of high schoolers that have graduated from here, some of them may even have been called by God to be nurses and to be powerful and wonderful in that way. But some people have spoken that in their life that they cannot be. And so you find them doing some, some stuff you ask them, what are you doing in college? Something graphic or whatever. Eh? What are you doing in college? Counseling so that I can. And you ask them, where is that one going to lead? What are you doing? Geography plus German. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you ask them, uh, they will not find a job. It will be hard for them to find a place to work. And you ask them, why can't you do something that is in this line? You can do something. It doesn't have to be, it has to, maybe in the medical field, you don't have to be a CNA. You can do something and be something higher. But they will say, no, I cannot do that. But when you ask them, you will find a parent who spoke and spoke that into their children. Yet it will bring food in the table. I will want you to know how the devil works. If the devil knows there is a resource in a certain way, in a certain area, he will say that is poison. So you don't touch it. Yet people have made life. People have succeeded and done very well. Doing nothing. You are doing so well. And that's what you do. Why don't you want somebody else to enjoy the same? You are going to heaven and that's what you do. Some people will say, I'll never do business. Leave me. I just want a job. Then I can be sure. Some people have said, I will never buy a house. Some people say, I am 50. I'll not go back to school. I'll never go back to, these are limiting vows. These are things that are limiting in somebody's life. There are people who have said and told people everywhere, I can never go to a Kenyan church. But from there, they are always online watching. Come to church. Don't just watch online. Just come and worship with us. If, if you said that, say, I changed my mind. You have changed your mind so many times. Change your mind and deliver yourself from these vows that you have put on your own life. Limiting vows that the enemy makes us make statements like that and keeps reminding you over and over that you said this. You can unsay it and say from now, I'll not go anywhere else except a Kenyan shash because I... And for your information, this is not a Kenyan church. You go to a Kenyan church, this is not. Extend your circle of influence. If you want to see abundance, how to increase your capacity. Increase your capacity by relieving yourself of these limitations. If you say you will not be married by somebody from another tribe, yet the brother looking at you is from another tribe. And he's super, he's good. Have you seen people from the same tribe killing each other? 
Yes. From the same tribe, you reach Okech, Okechua. <laughs> and they are from the same tribe. Kamau and Joki, they kill each other. Kamau and Jokish. Number five, extend your circle of influence. Some people have only room for, room for, three, for three people. Me, myself, and I. Some are saying four, mine. <laughs> if you want to grow, if you want to experience abundance in your life, you have to allow room for other people in your life. Let somebody else come and interfere with your space if you're going to be married. Amen? Allow others to come into your space and interfere with your space. Have room for us in your hearts. And the last one that I'm going to talk about is gain skills that will, be, will make you better at your job or gain new skills that will open new fields for you. Okay? I'll go uh, through them very quickly. Skills to better manage your resources. Every person in this house, you need to know just a little bit of management. And don't think because you pray in tongues, you know management. They don't go together. Amen? You have to train how to manage time. How do you manage time? You can manage time so that your work will look like work that has been done by two because you manage your time well. What you achieve in a week, people struggle to achieve in a month. Managing time. You have to find skills to be a better spouse. Because we all need. When we have the couples um, uh, events that we have, Try to be there. Come here one thing. Add a skill. Be a better parent. Skills to be a better parent. Skill on how to be a better person at what you do. This week, I was at an airport and uh, someone came in with a brand new Lexus. And I was looking at it. Uh, first of all, what caught my attention was it was a model that I had never seen. So I'm looking at it. And um a gentleman comes out, he's breathing, I could almost sense his breathing, his breathing tap to show his presence. He pulls in, and uh, obviously he has someone to pick up. He's an Uber driver. And these two old ladies who look like money, because this is a premium vehicle. I was also waiting for an Uber, but I was waiting for one of those Prius. <laughs> so this guy... Um, comes out. These two ladies are wanting uh, to get in. They have big bags. They are not paying me, but I feel like I'm going to go and help them put the bags in just because of their age. But this guy cannot handle himself. He's just wanting us to see that he's the one driving this ride here. And so he's just walking around and they are struggling with their bags where he parked, this one is struggling to remove something that was broken hard so they can sit in the back. And I'm sitting there saying, this guy has a good vehicle. He has this, but he's going to be reported by this lady. If they didn't report this guy, they are angels. Because he was, he almost neglected them. And I'm saying, he needs at least a skill on how to be a better Uber driver. If you're going to drive Uber, Go online, YouTube, and ask how to be a better premium driver. How you come out? Yes, ma'am. You know, carry the bags. Open the door for them. Let them get in. Take the bags in. Lock the door. Come in and sit. And then ask them, are you comfortable? Do you want me to change? Remove your Kikuyu music and put the music that they enjoy. Don't force them to listen to what you're listening. So this is something that you need the skills. You need to be taught. And beyond that, not just being that driver, beyond that, learn how to manage the money that comes in. Don't just say, I made 400 today. Hallelujah. I'm going to go out and um, I'm going to eat uh, a meal for 100 bucks. I made the money myself. I have to shake my own hand. So you go out 
And you are, you are out there munching all the money, not knowing that tomorrow you may not have as many customers as you had today. How do you manage? How do you write yourself a check every month and have some reserve? Because one day that vehicle is going to be needing replacement. How do I manage so that they can become two? Management is not going to be acquired by prayer. Management is a skill you have to be taught. And that is something that I'm going to just challenge you to increase your capacity, increase your ability, and God will feel. If you can manage a million, God will feel that. If you can manage two million, God will feel that. But you, have, you will not tell me that there's a prophetic word you'll hear from somebody that will make you a pilot. If you just tell me God spoke in my life, I'm a pilot now, I had no training, I had nothing, I'm just a pilot because there is a prophetic word and prayer and anointing oil, I'm going to jump out of your plane if it has not left the ground. No amount of prayer will make you a surgeon. You have to go and be trained. No amount of Bible study will make you a skilled hairdresser. You have to train for it. If you're going to increase in business, you have to know how to market your products. Amen? You have to know. Marketing is something that is almost a must for anyone living in our day. You have to know how to market, how to package, how to you know, speak on your own behalf, how to market yourself, how to market your products. Those are skills you have to learn if you are going to be somebody. But if you are wanting to, encourage, to just ensure that you have increased and you are going to enjoy abundance and you just want to get it just by seeking the Lord and waking up in the morning and saying, Father, this phone, I want it to ring. I want it to ring with somebody with a job for me or with a promotion. Those things don't happen. Amen. God feeds the birds of the air even when they don't toil, but he never takes worms up the trees. Those birds have to fly out and seek for it. Have you read that in the scriptures? They have to go out. They have to go out and work and be able to receive that which they have. So many of us are sitting on abundance. Many of us can enjoy abundance. It's the management of what God has given to us. People's skills. That if you are somebody's, if, if you are a client or if you are somebody's, you know, you drive for someone or if you are, you carry roads for a company, you know how, you, at least you know how to have the courtesy to communicate with the office. When you take the load, you call from time to time, letting them know your progress. You don't switch off your phone and say, let them not bother me. I'm driving. Let them, and, and you don't act rude and yes, expect God to come and cover your mistakes. With all his blessings. May God open up our minds and our hearts. So that we have increased ability. So that we are going to reach everything that God has. May the heart of this church be made as big as Solomon's heart. The Bible says he had a big heart. And that means that he had understanding in many areas of life. He was not a one channel person. But he made kingship to be more than just being a king. He was a consultant. He was somebody learned. He was skilled. He was writing songs. He was poetic. This man knew how to make silver be abundant in Jerusalem. The Bible says silver was like rocks in Jerusalem in his day. And gold was there in abundance. He had a big heart. May God give you such a heart. And may God expand and increase you so that you are going to be able to do more than your peers in whatever field you are in. I pray for many of you that are doing just a job from 8 to 5 or from 3 to 11. I pray that God is going to increase you. That you'll have something else on the side that you're doing. That God is going to open new abilities and channels. So that you're not going to just be fixed and tied to one channel. That God is going to increase and bring other channels in your life. That you're going to expand and increase. And he'll feel even that to capacity. That when you open a new door, a new business, God will feel it. When you open a new one, God will feel it. When you increase your abilities in that one business, God will expand it to the highest. So that God will be glorified through that which you do. May the abundance that God has promised in his word, may they, that be your experience. As you open your mind, as you open your heart, may God fill your mind and heart with understanding. 
and with the wisdom of God and the doors to get skills and the places to find the skills. May the wisdom of God find you. May you rise in the morning and be able to find places where God will speak to you and train your heart so that you can become everything that God has for your life. May not a single door be shut before you. Whatever you have increased and expanded in, may God open the best door in the city and may that door be open so that the supply of God can fill your house. And may that be the experience of everyone in this house. May those that are comfortable where they stand, may God bring discomfort in your heart. May God cause you to be stirred up. May God challenge your life. So that you are going to want more and desire so that you can be able to do and help others to the glory of God.